Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. His banner over us is love. Our sword, the word of God. We tread the road, the saints above, with shouts of triumph trod. By faith they like a whirlwind's breath swept on. The faith by which they conquer death is still our shining shield. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. On every hand the foe we find drawn up in dread. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. To him that overcomes the foe, white raiment shall be given, before the angels he shall know his name confessed in heaven. the victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. Savior, like a shepherd, lead us, much we need thy tender care. In thy pleasant pastures feed us, for our use thy foes prepare. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, Thou hast bought us Thine we are. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, Thou hast bought us Thine we are. We are Thine, do Thou befriend us, Be the guardian of our way. Keep thy flock from sin, defend us, seek us when we go astray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, hear, oh, hear us when we pray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, hear, oh, hear us when we pray. Thou hast promised to receive us, poor and sinful though we be. Thou hast mercy to relieve us, grace to cleanse and power to free. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, early let us turn to Thee. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, early let us turn to Thee. Early let us seek Thy favor, early let us do Thy will. Blessed Lord and only Savior, with Thy love our bosoms fill. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, Thou hast loved us, love us still. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, Thou hast loved us, love us still.
And verse 4, if you would, I want to read a few different verses here in the book of Luke. Luke 12 and verse 4 says, And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. That him is God. God has power to cast your body and soul into hell. God. Last week we talked about the importance of, of fearing God. I want us to dig deeper on it this week with a big reason why we should fear God. And here's a big part of it. God is the one who throws the soul into hell. It's undeniable, and it's undeniable how bad hell is. I marvel in my, at my work. I went out to my car this week, and I found this little pamphlet in the door, and it is a pamphlet that teaches all the myths about hell. In fact, it makes hell sound not really bad at all. I might end up going there just for a vacation, summer house. And then at the end, it asks you, you know, do you want to accept Christ as your Savior? It's from a Jehovah Witness publisher, I believe, teaching a false gospel, teaching that the consequences for our sins aren't so bad. Friends, the Word of God says here that you surely are cast into hell. Friends, I want you to think about this thought and think deeply on this thought. If this verse is true and God sends people to hell... There are people in hell this morning, this very moment, who wish they could be sitting where you are sitting with one more chance to accept the Savior Jesus Christ. But they have no more chances. But you do. As we said this morning, that is God's mercy, the fact that we are sitting here today able to seek the Savior Jesus Christ or to serve the Savior Jesus Christ. That's God's mercy. Hell is real, as we'll cover. Hell is a place of fire and pain and torment. People in hell suffer the wrath of Almighty God forever and ever and ever. An age passes and they're still burning in hell. Another age passes and they are still burning in hell. It may sound inconceivable to us, but it's true. We'll study that this morning. Look across the page, please, to um, chapter 12 and verse 20. It says, But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? 
We preached that recently. I'm not preaching it again. I'm simply reminding you that there was this man in Luke chapter 12 who spent his life gathering all kinds of things and had a lot of things only to die that night and God to call him a fool. To go unto eternity without the Savior, Jesus Christ, is the most foolish thing a person can ever do. Today, I'm going to share with you the Savior, Jesus Christ, and I'm going to share with you the reality of not accepting the Savior, Jesus Christ, and it is true. Please turn at Luke chapter 16, a few pages over, Luke chapter 16. See, there are many churches today that will try to teach you that hell isn't so bad and that you're just fine. And I'm going to tell you that hell is terrible and you are in terrible shape if you don't know the Savior truly. Look at Luke 16 and verse 22. Again, I won't tell the whole story. I just want to show you that hell is real. 16:22, And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. That's the believer was the beggar. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes being in torments. That's reality. This rich man died, never having believed in a Savior. He went straight to hell. Lifts up his eyes in torments and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. We've studied this passage before. I can explain to you what Abraham means and Lazarus means here and where they're at, but that's not the lesson. I simply want you to realize this rich man died without the Savior and he lifts up his eyes being in torments. It says he's tormented in the flame. It says that he wishes he had a drop of water to cool his tongue. This is torment that goes on forever and ever. They have rest nor day nor night. Hell is an eternal state of judgment by a wrathful, holy God. You might be already asking, how could this place be real? How could it be true that someone burns forever and ever? Isn't enough enough at some point? How could a loving God throw someone into such a place? Let's study this together. Please turn in 2 Samuel chapter 12. 2 Samuel chapter 12. I'm glad you are here this morning. That means God is showing you mercy for yet another time. Second Samuel 12. I want to talk about this idea of holiness and judgment. What is commensurate? What is right? Do we deserve a place called hell? Do you really burn forever? Let's first think about this passage in 2 Samuel chapter 12. Now you know this story in 2 Samuel chapter 12. This is right after David committed adultery with Bathsheba. He commits adultery with another man's wife. And then he gets caught because she's with child. And then he has the man killed. It spirals out of control as sin always does. But enter chapter 12, and you'll see Nathan tells David the truth. Look at 12, verse 1. And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds. Please focus on this story. Get engrossed in the reality of this story. The rich man had many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb which he had brought which he had bought and nourished up and it grew up together with him and with his children and it did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter this poor man has nothing but one little lamb and this man treats this little lamb as his best friend ever the lamb eats the man's food drinks the man's water lives with him lies with him 
This poor man, that's all he has is that little lamb. And then think of this rich man who has a field full of sheep. Tons of sheep, right? Rich man has plenty of sheep. But watch verse 4. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man was come to him. This rich man has a visitor, and the visitor needs to eat. So the rich man could take of his own flock and feed the visitor. The rich man forgets about all the sheep that he has, and he goes over to that poor man and takes the only sheep that he's got, probably right out of his lap, and then kills that sheep and feeds it to his visitor. Does everybody understand how unfair that is? Everybody understand how wrong that is? Everyone to a person in this room, we can all agree, can't we, that that rich man should not have done that. Does that make sense? It was wrong. Think about it long and hard enough, you might get a little bit upset. Why would that man do that to that poor man? Watch verse 5. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. David here, who's just committed adultery, who's just committed murder, still has what is called righteous indignation. He still realizes how wrong this is. He knows it innately that this is wrong. He's angry about it. He knows this is wrong. We as sinners in this room, we know that this is wrong and that that rich man should be judged, do we not? Six, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing, because he had no pity. David in his sinful state says, that rich man should die? That rich man should pay back four times what he stole? And David's just an unholy, wicked man, but he still understands righteous indignation. Righteous indignation. I want us to think about this. I want you to think about a different kind of response. What if David said, or what if a judge said, hey, you know what? That rich man is okay. I love that rich man. He's okay. No punishment, no judgment will fall upon that rich man. If a judge said that, would a judge be righteous and holy? Or would such a judge be corrupt? Such a judge would be corrupt, would they not? You see, a righteous judge judges righteously. And when there's wrong, they meet the wrong with the perfect amount of punishment for the wrong. How about this? Only a wicked God would say that unrepentant sinners deserve no punishment. Only a corrupt God would say, you've lived in sin your whole life. I hate sin. Sin is abominable. Sin is destructive. But no punishment will come to your head. A corrupt God would say that. A righteous God will say, You, sir, are guilty in your trespasses and sins. A holy God, where one sin offends his holy eyes, would say, You are guilty. This concept is called righteous indignation. I use it sometimes to try to witness to people who, when they say, You know, hell can't be real, punishment can't be real. And then I'll just, even if they're an atheist, I'll try to tell them, well, do you think anything's wrong? Is it wrong for an adult to hurt a little child? Is that wrong? Oh, yeah, of course that's wrong. You know, of course that, that needs to be punished. You know what that is? That's called righteous indignation. That's proof that God is real and that hell is real. The fact that evil is punished, we all know it. Only in our upside-down, backwards world do today we try to say, evil is not punished. Evil is accepted. That's an upside-down world. Even in our churches, and their little pamphlets today are upside-down now. Evil is acceptable with God. It is not. Punishment falls. Righteous indignation. You know what the word indignation means? We'll see it in Scripture. 
Indignation means anger or extreme anger, mingled with contempt, disgust, or abhorrence. David is disgusted at this rich man. David abhors this rich man. David is angry at this rich man. God is with sinners in a holier way and in a more severe way. Please go to our chapter, Psalm 129. I want to show you one phrase there. Psalm 129. You know our church, we like to turn in our Bible, so I'm going to go a lot of places. If it helps you to follow along, there are Bibles available. Psalm 129. I want to show you one phrase. Sometimes we preach the whole chapter. Today I want to show you one phrase, Psalm 129, verse 4. You might be able to pick it out. Psalm 129, 4 says, The Lord is righteous. Righteous. Righteous means, in its purest, simplest definition, righteous means in accordance with divine law. Right? A righteous judge will judge in accordance with divine law. They won't deviate from a God-given law. You do this crime, you get this punishment. That's righteousness, right? Our world is painting a God who is not a righteous judge. A God who says, yeah, there's that crime, but you don't get the punishment. That's not the God we serve. Our God is righteous. Look at Psalm 7, way back at the start of our psalm series. We noted Psalm 7 and the importance of it. Thank you for being here today. This is an important topic. Look at Psalm 7, please. Verse 8. So shall the congregation of the people compass thee about... For their sakes, therefore return thou on high. Eight, um, seven verse eight. The Lord shall judge the people. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to mine integrity that is in me. O let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end, but establish the just. For the righteous God trieth the hearts and reigns. My defense is of God, which saveth the upright. God judgeth the righteous. Look at that. And God is angry with the wicked every day. You ever seen that verse? It's Psalm chapter 7, verse 11. God judges the righteous, and God is angry with the wicked every day. This section of Scripture calls God a judge. Again, it calls God righteous, and it even introduces this concept that our righteous judge, God, is angry with the wicked every day. Those are important lines to realize when you one day will stand before this judge and you already know his mood has been soured by your sin. Some people picture God as this great day up there, great uh, reunion in heaven. No, if you are standing in your sin, it's not a wonderful reunion. It's a sentence before an almighty, holy judge. It's a sentencing hour. Look at chapter 9, please, while we're here. 9 and verse 7. Just speaking more about God being this judge. 9, 7. But the Lord shall endure forever. He hath prepared his throne for judgment. He shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. Amen. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. For thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. Look down at verse 17. The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. The Bible says that all the people of the nation are going to be thrown into hell. Wicked nations, that's like the one we're in now, a wicked nation that has forgotten God. In a holistic sense, this whole nation is going to be thrown into hell, all the peoples of it, for turning from God. But I want you to think about you, friend. Have you forgotten the God that you know exists, that you know is real, that you know you will face one day? Have you forgotten Him? Please look at chapter 10. 
Verse 3, For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire, and blesseth the covetous whom the Lord abhorreth. The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. Friends, it says the wicked, through the pride in their hearts, will not seek after God. God's not in your thoughts. That's what the Bible says. His ways are always grievous. Thy judgments are far above out of his sight. See that phrase there? God's judgments are far above out of your sights. You may be struggling with this idea of an eternal hell where you burn forever, where your friends who do not believe in Christ will burn forever, where your relatives who you love who do not believe in Christ will burn forever. You may be struggling it, with it because God's judgments are far out of your sight. We're focused on the temporal. We're focused on sin. We're focused on our possessions. And we miss the reality of God and His holiness. It says in verse 6, He hath said in his heart, I shall not be moved, for I shall never be in adversity. The unbeliever believes that they will go on perpetually. They may not say it outright that they're going to live forever, but they live as if they're going to live forever. They collect as if they're going to live forever. Ever notice that? We consume possessions as if we're going to live for another 50, 100 years, not knowing like the fool in Luke chapter 12, tonight your soul might be required of you. This might very well be the last chance you get to ponder if Christ is real or not. You will be moved. Eventually, time does run out in your life. Look at verse 7. His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud. Under his tongue is mischief and vanity. There is our mouth. And you wonder why God is angry with the wicked. Our tongues are full of cursing, deceit, fraud, mischief, vanity. That's humanity in a nutshell. That's our conversation. God is angry with the wicked. Please turn in your Bibles back to 2 Samuel chapter 12. 2 Samuel chapter 12. It's said there in those Psalms, it says that God's prepared his throne for judgment. God is all set up for Judgment Day. Do you realize that? He's got it all set up in place. He's ready for that conversation. I'm asking you this morning, are you ready for that conversation to stand before God, your Creator? Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are actually born again? Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're saved? 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 7 I want to look deeper this story now. The same story with David. We're right back to the same place. <laughs> and talk about, is it wrong for God to be angry? Look at verse 7. It says, And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anoint thee king over Israel, and deliver thee out of the hand of Saul. Remember David's all upset about that story about the rich man with the lamb? Nathan says, you're the man, David. You're the one guilty. You're the one who will face judgment, David. Friends, this morning I want to tell you that you are the man, the woman. You are the one. You are the one who are guilty before God, who will face God's judgment. It's you. Let this next section of Scripture, please, apply to your heart. Nathan says, David, you're the man. What were David's sins again? David's sins were adultery and murder. Big sins, granted. But friends, you're the man. You're the woman. You know what the Bible says in Matthew 5, 28? It says, Whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. God hates adultery. Christ tells us that even lusting is something that God hates. 
Friends, we are the man. You say, Logan, these people live their lives and they don't do anything too bad. You're telling me they're going to be thrown into hell and burned forever and ever? I say, yes, they will. Because even the act of lusting at a woman, God hates, God despises. It's abominable. Think about this, friends, also in our Christian life, our Christian context, how God views our sins as Christians. How about that phrase, or David murdered someone? You know what it says in 1 John 3, 15? It said, whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. There are many people who live their whole life and they never committed adultery and I ain't never killed nobody, right? I've heard it actually as I witness to people on the doorstep. I ain't never done anything too wrong. Didn't kill anybody here. I'll bet you hated somebody. And hating somebody is so abominable in God's eyes, he views it like a murder. God is so holy, you realize his standards are greater than ours. All of us in the room can realize that, yeah, you, know, you murder somebody, you should be in jail, you should you get the death sentence, right? Clearly, we could all agree on that. But us in this room, would we all say you hate somebody? You know, you're hating somebody without a cause? You're just a hateful, vengeful, wrathful kind of person? You'd be punished too? Could we go that far? Oh, God sure does. God says it's evil. God says it's sin. God sends people to hell for sin. We are the ones guilty. We are the ones who will stand before a wrathful, vengeful God. Don't kid yourself. You know what it says? Let me read you Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. Let me read you this. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19 says, These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look. Who's ever been proud? Who's ever walked around with arrogance before? I have. Who's ever had a lying tongue? The Bible says God hates a lying tongue. Who's ever told a lie? I have. It says God hates hands that shed innocent blood. It says God hates an heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Do we have wicked imaginations, friends? Yes, we do, from time to time. Feet that be swift in running to mischief. Friends, do we have feet that run away from obeying God? Run away from where he tells us to go and we go our own way? Friends, yes, we do. It says God hates a false witness that speaketh lies and he that soweth discord among the brethren. Do you understand God has every reason to bring wrath upon us? We are prideful. We are liars. We have wicked thoughts. We run disobediently to mischief. We sow discord. We are fully worthy of God's wrath. Do we understand this? You know what this sermon is? For the person who has put their whole trust into Jesus Christ, it's a sigh of relief. Yeah, Pastor Logan, I'm guilty of all those things, but I'm trusting fully in the blood of Christ, and I'm sure as I'm standing here that my sins are washed away because of Christ. For the believer, we hear this sermon, we say, yeah, that's me, that's me, that's me, that's me. Whoo! Christ paid it all. If you don't have that whoo, though, if you're not sure that you're saved, though, you're in a bad spot. And that's why God's having us preach this today, because you'll stand in judgment for your own sins. And God's angry, and God hates some things we've done. He sure does. Look at verse 8. Look at verse 8. I want to cover six reasons, six reasons why we fully deserve God's wrath and judgment. And Christians, I think it might even be good for our lives. Watch this. Six reasons we fully deserve God's wrath and judgment. Verse 8 says, And I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. We fully deserve God's wrath because God has given us so so, so much. And what do we do as people? We always want something more. God, I want something more. I want some more possessions. I may even want this other sin, Lord. I need this other sin. I have to have this other sin. Yet God has given us so much already. We deserve God's wrath because we frankly are unthankful for what he's given us. We are an unthankful people. 
We deserve God's wrath. He's given us so much, yet we have to have our sin. What you've given me, God, is enough. I've got to dabble in this sin, whatever it is, this lust, this overindulgence, right? This lifestyle, heaven forbid. Look at verse 9. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord, Nathan says to David, to do evil in his sight? <coughs> thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword and hast taken his wife to be thy wife and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Oh, my word, David has become so unthankful. You know what? David has a great man of God, David. You know what David has done? It says there at the start, thou hast despised the commandment of the Lord. David knows adultery is wrong. David knows that murder is wrong, but he had to have it. Have to have it. David deserves every bit of God's wrath. Friends, we deserve every bit of God's wrath because we despise and disobey this book. You want to be honest with me this morning? There are passages in this book that you simply do not want to conform to because you want your sin instead of obeying God. I say, okay, that's your prerogative, but I want to tell you God's angry about it. God never responds favorably to us despising His words on the page. You say, Logan, well, I'm in this sin that's got me all tangled up and there's really no way out of it. It's just going to ruin my life to get out of sin. It's going to mess things up if I get out of sin. Hogwash. The best answer is always to get out of sin. We deserve God's wrath because we despise this book. We disobey this word day after day. We deserve God's wrath. Look at verse 10. Oh, let me read you a verse, I'm sorry, on that last point. Numbers 15, 31. Let me read you this. 15, Numbers 15, 31 says, Because he hath despised the word of the Lord and hath broken his commandment, that soul shall utterly be cut off. His iniquity shall be upon him. Again, to reinforce this concept, God does not look favorably on you seeing a verse in Scripture and saying, okay, I'm going to break the rule. Look at verse, please. Look at verse 10. Now, no, I skipped. Yes, verse 10. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. We fully deserve God's wrath. David certainly deserves God's wrath. Because we despise God with our lives. Say, Logan, I don't quite believe that. What do you mean I despise God with my life? I love God. Well, you're not living like it. You know what God's into? Actions, not words. You know what God says in John 14, 15? If ye love me, keep my commandments. God is a true, righteous, holy being. And just saying, Jesus, I love you, doesn't cut it with him. Don't tell me you love the Lord. Don't tell me your friends and relatives love the Lord if they are living in disobedience, clear disobedience to God's word. There is no love there for God. What you have for God is a relationship where you're just a taker, not a giver. You want God's blessings. You want God's nice things. But you don't really give a darn about what he really says for you to do. That's not a loving relationship, right? That's one of those bad relationships. Where you don't care what the other party says. Don't tell me you love God if you're going to disobey this book right out. We deserve God's wrath because we despise God with our lives. Look at verse 11. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house. I will take thy wives before thine eyes and give them unto thy neighbor. And he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of the sun. For thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. You know why we deserve God's wrath? Yet another reason. We deserve God's wrath because of our secret sins. These are our secret sins in our own lives. We hide them from the world very well. No one knows about them but us. No one knows the perversion of our minds. No one knows the pride of our hearts, right? 
covetous nature that we truly have and we thrive on. No one knows those sins but us and Almighty God. You know, we are good at being a defense attorney today instead of funerals where we preach on hell and sin. Instead, we do celebrations of life. In our own way, we try to make the case for how good this person is. <laughs> They were a wonderful farmer, wonderful friend, a wonderful husband, wonderful wife, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And let's just say that this person was quite wonderful in many ways to our eyes. I guarantee you they had a secret sin life that was abominable to Almighty God. People are thrown into hell, and mark my words, no one's innocent. No one's innocent. We deserve God's wrath because of our secret sins, the ones no one else even knows about. It says in Psalm 90, verse 7 and 8, it says, For we are consumed by thine anger, and by thy wrath we are troubled. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins, in the light of thy countenance. You may have everybody fooled, but God's got your secret sins up on a pedestal with a big old mag light flashlight looking down. Maybe not that brand, I don't know. But he knows your secret sins. People go to hell for the lives that we cannot even see. The world may not know how wicked we are, but God does. God does. God sees it all. Look at verse 13. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. You know what David does right here in verse 13? And what I'm asking, God, asking you to do this morning David repented. David changed his mind. Do you remember he enters this conversation kind of in a sly or just kind of uppity way? Yeah, that guy's terrible, that, that rich guy with the land, just terrible. By this point of Nathan's sermon, David realizes, no, it's me that needs to change. I'm the problem. I'm the sinner. I'm the one standing before the wrath of Almighty God about to fall. But do you know why people go to hell? And people fully deserve that wrath because we do not repent. Right? Think about someone you love. I'll name my grandfather who I love dearly. A good salt-of-the-earth man, a, 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 a World War II veteran. Wonderful man. I couldn't see sins in his life. That I mean, clear sins that I could tell. He never repented, though. He never, to God, changed his mind about his life, to my knowledge. To my knowledge, he's in sin today, and it's his own darn, he's in hell today, excuse me, and it's his own fault, because he simply did not want to change his mind about his sin and accept the Savior, Jesus Christ. He's in hell today because he deserves to be in hell today. Don't you land there. We deserve God's wrath because we have not repented. You can, friends, think of that in the Christian life as well. You know that? I'm not saying you need to get saved again. No such thing. But if you are not confessing and turning from your sins, you're walking on thin ice with God. The Bible says in Acts 17.30, God commandeth all men everywhere to repent. In that context, it's certainly talking about salvation. God commands you to repent. Look at verse 14. Howbeit because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. You say, Logan, what happened here in this story? David just repented. And then God says through Nathan that, David, you're not going to die. You put away this sin from you, you're not going to die. But you know what? Judgment still falls in David's life. How can this be? God is still holy. God is still just. Judgment still falls. This speaks to this idea, friends, of Christians living however they want to live. It says in verse 14 there, it says, We've given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to speak blasphemy. You know why we deserve God's wrath, both as an unsaved person and as a saved person? is because we've helped the cause of the enemy of Christ with our lives. God does not look favorably upon this. 
When our life is one of pointing people more towards sin than the Savior, God's not happy about that. When our life is one that never stands up against lies, in fact, we accept lies and we can fellowship with lies, God's not happy about that. We give Him great occasion for the enemy. We fully deserve God's wrath because we've done that. We've stood with God's enemies. As an unsaved person who doesn't know the Savior, one day when you're burning in hell, you'll understand that you're to blame, not just for yourself, but the relatives that start landing next to you in hell, that you had a hand in them never believe in the truth. They followed grandpa's pattern. They followed dad's pattern. They followed the aunt's pattern of life, of unbelief, of living for yourself. Right? You'll land there in an unhappy state and realize that you're to blame for a lot more damage too. We fully deserve God's wrath. Your sin does affect the lives of those around you. Look at verse 15. 15. We just covered the sixth, six reasons why we fully deserve God's wrath. Now let's look at God's judgment will fall on David. David's life. Look at 15. And Nathan departed unto his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. David's a believer. David has faith, and David knows God's judgment is here. He's pleading for mercy. 17, and the elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him up from the earth, but he would not, neither did he eat bread with them. And it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died. And the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead, for they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spake unto him, and he would not hearken unto our voice. How will he then vex himself if we tell him that the child is dead? This child has died. Verse 19, But when David saw that his servants whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said unto his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. Judgment falls here because of a man's sin, a man named David. A child dies. A son is lost. What's our response? Yeah, God, that was unfair, wasn't it? Why'd you hurt the baby, God? What happened there? Sad? Yes. Is God a righteous judge? Yes. Does your sin impact others? Yes. Think about that. In this dramatic sense, David's sins bring destruction on another life. Friends, you live the same thing today with your lives. You want to live in sin you are bringing destruction and scattering people all around you. That's why sometimes I marvel. I meet Christians who tell me, and I believe they're Christians because they profess the gospel. Their fruits look shady sometimes, but they'll say, I believe the gospel. And I'll say, okay, well, you, you've got to get out of this lifestyle sin. It's only going to cause destruction. And they'll tell me, that's just too hard. That's just, that's just too hard, you know? God really wants me to do something that hard. Yeah, He does. Because your sin is destroying you and your sin is destroying others. God does want us to get out of our sin, out of love for others. Our sins impact others. Here the, the child dies. God is a righteous judge. Judgment falls. God knew that this sin would hurt David. It's a punishment for David. It did hurt him. But look at verse 20. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came to the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he came to his own house and he required, and when he required, they set bread before him and he did eat. Look at David. You don't see David mad or arguing with God, do you? David, you see David's outlook. You know what David understands? Something that we're trying to teach this morning that God's wrath is called for. God's wrath is merited. David has no questions about it. Friends, in this moment of growth for the Christian in our church, I want us to get a full grasp that hell is merited. We fully deserve it. That's why the Savior is so wonderful. That's why the Savior is so needed, because no one's going to escape without Christ as their Savior. We are the man.
We are the woman who deserve God's judgment. Look at verse 21. Then said his servants unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive, but when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread. And he said, While the child was yet alive, I fast and wept, for I said, Who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead, wherefore should I fast? Can I go bring him back again? I shall not go, but he shall, I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Again, friends, I want to talk about that point. Where is God's mercy? God's mercy, like we said in Sunday school, is time. David was pleading during that window of time, Lord, save this child. But eventually time ran out, and God's righteous judgment fell, and then David realized it's done. It's over. It's finished. Friends, that's the end of your life. If you are breathing air right now, you have this thing called God's mercy, which is the time you are receiving to suck that air. But one day, you will stop breathing, your eyes will close for the last time, and then the clock has stopped. Nothing else we can do. There, the, the purgatory of the Catholic Church and the holding zone in the Mormon Church is all nonsense. Once you close your eyes, you go out into eternity forever and ever, either in heaven or hell. Your soul goes only two places. There's no holding tank for those who didn't believe. Straight to hell. As it just said in Luke at the start of our sermon. David knew that each second that the child was alive was of God's mercy and was a moment for God still to do a work. To save the child. David pled for it. David pled for it. Friends, we shouldn't be like David in the adultery and the murder, but we should be like David with the faith and calling out for God to save, if you will, right? For God to save a soul before it's too late, right? The wonderful thing about salvation is that God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, right? God wants people to turn to the Savior. He certainly does. It says in Lamentations 3.22, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. We said that in Sunday school. And let me remind you again, this morning, this church service, how hokey it may be, how foolish I may appear, how you may never come back again because it's just not for you. If you never come back again, okay, I want you to remember, though, that this morning is a picture of God's grace. Not me. But the fact that you're breathing and God's holy word is before your eyes. That's God's grace. That's God's mercy. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do with it? You're going to continue to take time for granted? You don't have time to take for granted. You don't know what's on the morrow. You don't know what's going to happen tonight. This morning is God's long-suffering. This morning, God is giving a sinful people one more chance to accept Christ, one more chance for the believer to get right. As we wind down, please look at the book of Revelation, the powerful book of Revelation. Look at Revelation 19. Revelation 19. I should not, I should not have, uh, and sometimes in preaching I have this, this strange position when I talk about the gospel of being happy when I talk about the topic. I'm sorry, it's a self-centered kind of thing that I struggle with, but I'm happy that I have the answer for you. And I'm happy that I have a Savior in Jesus Christ. I'm happy that you found the Savior in Jesus Christ. So forgive me if I present this matter of life and death with some optimism, forgive me, because if you don't have Christ your Savior, there's no optimism. You're going straight to hell. And it is truly the saddest thing I can think of. Forgive me. Pray for me on how I should present this. If you're saved, it's wonderful. If you're not saved, it's the worst thing ever. Look at Revelation 19, 11. I want to introduce you to Christ. 
19.11, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and his, on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of his wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Friends, let me introduce to you Jesus Christ coming back for this second time. This is when the world will see him for the second time as the King of Kings, as the Lord of Lords, as someone with fierceness, wrath. It's the second coming of Christ. Friends, you know, some of us might not be alive when Christ comes back to this earth. We might not be alive, but you know what, friends? You're going to die, and when you open your eyes, you will see Christ again for the second time. And I want you to know that that's who he is. Holy, righteous, pure, who brings righteous judgment on the wicked. You're going to get before Christ, the man that you've blasphemed your whole life, the man that you've rejected your whole life, the man that you've been nonchalant about, you said some little prayer, but really you didn't really give a darn about it. That man, one day you'll stand before guilty. Guilty in your sin. This is Christ. Yes, Christ is the Savior. Christ is also the judge. Holy, righteous, pure. If you look at chapter, or right at verse 20, look at verse 20. And the beast was taken with him, the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. You know this false prophet and this beast... They are people, and they're cast alive into the lake of fire. If we study Revelation, you see these things. They're cast alive into the lake of the fire. Look at the next chapter, chapter 20 and verse 10. These two men are cast alive in the lake of fire. One thousand years past, Revelation 20, verse 10, it says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are. And shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. These two men, the beast and the false prophet, they're burning in a lake of fire forever and ever. And after a thousand years past, they're still there burning forever and ever. Friends, this track is an ungodly assault on the truth of reality. Because I know you in your life, in your wicked state, in my wicked state, we like to think that, yeah, you know, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. I drop into hell, I burn up, boom. That's it. Made the wrong choice, I guess, okay? Got what I deserved, I guess. It's not so easy. It's not so easy. Think of the most dreadful thing you've been in your whole life and think about it never ending. Just think about that. It still pales to hell, okay? But anybody ever had a toothache? I've had a toothache. Toothaches are bad. Think about a toothache that you have for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. That's bad. Well, hell is a lot more than a toothache. We deserve every minute of it. I'm telling you today, you don't have to go there. These men burned forever and ever, day nor night. Look at the next verse, Revelation 20, 11, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great. That's, those are people, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things, which are written in the books according to their works. These books are opened. Stories of your life, sir. Stories of your life, ma'am. The books are open that tell how you've lived. And what can't be missed on every page of our lives is a nasty three-letter word called sin. On every page of our lives, guilt, 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 guilt. 
13. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. You die once, tragic. You die again, thrown into the lake of fire. That's your state for eternity. Never-ending torment, never-ending pain. Time passes, and here you still are in anguish. Time passes, and here you are still wrestling with this fact that you heard that goofy minister talking, and you said, nah, let's just go back and watch TV. Nah, let's go back and check the computer. Nah, let's go back to our sin. Let's go back in the world. Let's go back to our friends. Friends, you make a bad choice. And in hell, you'll wrestle with that for eternity. Can you imagine that? It says in verse 15, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Is your name written in the book of life? Your name is in the book of life when you accept Christ as your Savior. Are you sure your name is on the page? Double check. Triple check. Now is a good time to make sure you're saved. Standing before God it will be the wrong time. He will say, I gave you plenty of my mercy and my long suffering. And you sat there and yawned through service after service until eventually you could walk away from a good church, till eventually you could walk away from the Word of God and try to put it out of your mind and be willingly ignorant. I gave you your chance. To close, and truly to close, it's John chapter 3. I want to show you a verse in John chapter 3. God is a righteous judge. And God says our sin deserves damnation forever and ever, age after age, misery. Think of yourself, think of others, and consider what manner of person ought you to be, like we said in Sunday school. What kind of life are you going to live for the Lord? This is the kind of preaching that I heard when I was younger, and it made me at least in some sense say that, well, my life needs to be busy about God's work. And that's a good result of a decent church. That should be your life as well. What are you going to do for the Lord? Because this is true. This is true. Live a life that matters. Live it for the Lord. Be an example of a, someone getting saved and be an example of a Christian losing their life to follow the Savior. Losing their pet sin to obey the Word of God. It will inspire John 3, a famous chapter. You know the start of it. John 3, 16, you know. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Wonderful promise, John 3, 16. Many an unbeliever knows it. Many an unbeliever will be in hell for ages after ages with that verse still running through their minds. I want to show you a verse, though. Look at verse 36. For you to consider. John 3, 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. That's what I'm offering you today. To accept Christ as your Savior. To come forward and at this very altar plead for God to save your soul and He'll give it freely. He doesn't care what you've done in your past. We're all sinners to Him. We all can be saved by the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ is that powerful to wash our sins away. God simply wants you as a person to quit your pride and your wisdom and your smarts, and some of you all are quite smart, but simply plead as a child would to save me, Lord. Save me, Lord. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. For the unbeliever, it's a perpetual, never-ending state of never being able to please a holy, righteous God. Always facing God's wrath in the flames of hell fire. Because you are too stubborn, you are too skeptical, you are too into sin and possessions to ever take your sin and the Savior seriously. That's what I'm pleading for. Take it seriously. 
Christ is real. And without him, you burn forever and ever in the lake of fire. Hebrews 2, 3 says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? You will not escape if you neglect Jesus Christ as your Savior. Fear God, accept Christ today. Romans 5, 9, the last verse I'll quote for you, says, Being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. God is so wonderful that despite His wrath and hatred for sin, He sent His wonderful Savior to this earth to die on the cross for your sins, accept God's love in the face of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, I firmly believe in, in our midst today, Lord, are people who have not made a decision about Jesus Christ. They've either kicked the can their whole, down the road their whole lives about this decision. They've tried to completely forget about this decision. They're not serious about it now. Lord, you can see that by the way they live, how they remain in sin, and how they don't share the Savior with anybody, Lord. You can see it from their life that they don't really believe this gospel story. I pray that this morning these scriptures have done some work on softening their hearts that now they are ready in this moment to turn to the Savior. We'll give you all the honor and glory and praise, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.